four is a perfect square. Four is a square. Perfect square. I guess everything is a square. You can square something to get up any number you want. Uh, so four is a perfect square. When we split this into two square roots, the square root of four will be perfectly two. Whereas 6 times 32, if I were to split these into two different square roots, neither one of them becomes an essential. 6 is not a perfect square, so it doesn't have a square root. 32 is not a perfect square, so it doesn't have a perfect square root. So it doesn't become an essential. What more could Kieran do? Except simplify the square root of 32. Okay, so apparently we can, we can do that. How are we going to do that? We're going to factor it, right? How are we going to factor it? Six times eight? Six times eight. Four and twelve. Four and twelve? Which should we choose six times eight or four times twelve? Four times twelve. So if we choose six times eight, when we do two times square root of six times square root of eight, which one of these is going to simplify? Eight. Eight. How? What's the square root of eight? There's a, there's a square number as a factor of 8, but 8's not a perfect square either, so it will factor up to that, give it up, about 4 times what? 12? 12. 4 times 12? 2 times the square root of 4 times the square root of 12. 2 times 2 times the square root of 12. 4 times the square root of 12. So we go simplify the square root of 12. Yep. Wow. 4 and 3. 4 and 3. Times the square root of four times the square root of three. That's four times two. That's eight times the square root of three. Does it have to take that many steps? How can it be factored? What is eight the square root of? So let's say we were going to go over here and say this came from 64. The square root of 64 times the square root of 3. Couldn't we just, if we had seen it, made this originally just the square root of 64 times 3? Then split it. The square root of 64 times the square root of 3. The square root of 64 is 8 times the square root of 3. Getting there this way is fine too. Just kind of do it like three rounds of simplifying. So here's a step circled in green, which comes from this step. We're going from here to there. So Vladimir is uh, simplifying this uh, square root of a quotient. And uh, why is Vlad's simplification incorrect from here to there? What's up there just to confuse you. I see this all the time. People taking square roots, factoring them, okay? Got, got the right idea, partially the right idea there. And then they just take the one that they happen to have written on the left, because they could have written seven times five. They take the one that happens to be on the left and just make the disappear the square root, right? They disappear the radical. And uh, disappearing things is not a mathematical concept. You can't just disappear things. So I don't know where that went. But it is essentially saying, since this is the square root of 5 times the square root of 7, 
Sin squared five is five. That's not true. Squared five is not five. All the other parts have stayed the same. So we can't do that. Can't do that. Don't just simply factor it and then disappear a square root and then leave the other one as a square root or another way to do that. That's what I did. Um, how can Vlad tell that this expression cannot be simplified beyond the square root of 35 over 6, which is right here? How could he, at that stage, just say, because 35 is not a square number. Okay, but neither was 192. So we simplified it to 8 root 3. Um, can you go back to the... I will go back to that. Well, because you're, uh, you're taking 36 and you're taking that to 6. Yes. And so that part's correct. But then when you get to 35, yeah. you're, you, can't, you can't really simplify it any more than that. How you're saying the, you're saying truth here, but how can Vlad tell? Uh, uh, the factors of thirty-five don't have a perfect square root. Right. If, we're, if what we're going to do is factor thirty-five, one of the factors needs to be a perfect square and have a perfect square root. And no matter how you slice it, thirty-five, no factors of thirty-five are going to be perfect squares. This is actually the only factorization there is besides thirty-five times one. What do you guys think? Exactly recently? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, no matter how you factor 50, uh, 57, no matter where you factor 35, there are no perfect squares that are factored to 35. So uh, none of the factors. That's the reason why I crossed it. None of the factors of 35. this problem and has chosen uh, as her first step to uh, divide both sides by negative one. So now everything's positive. Rosalind likes positive numbers. Then she takes the square root of both sides. Why, if, if she chooses to take the square root, why is the next line incorrect? Write a little something to yourself, a little note to yourself. <coughs> So why would the next line be incorrect? If you can take the square root of both sides, why is the next line incorrect? Because Gavin 3 isn't the square root of 3. Okay, so what Gavin is saying is if you're going to take the square root of both sides, she took the square root of w squared, but didn't even recognize that you're supposed to take the square root of 3. What is the square root of 3? Some, yeah, some, some, decimal, some number. decimal number between 1 and 2. Right? 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 is bigger than 3. So one point something. Technically speaking, the square root of three is the square root of three. There's no perfect square root for three. So we have to, when we take the square root of both sides, we have to recognize like what comes out of that. The result of that needs to be the square root of the thing before it. And if we can't multiply this thing by itself to get this, then we haven't taken the square root correctly. Now it's correct. If we multiply the square root of 3 by itself, we'll get 3. If we multiply w by itself, we get w squared. But, um, let me just write this down real quick. But, now that we
we see it for what it really is, see the truth of it, do we want to do that? Do we want to take the square root right away? No. Okay, so should Rosalind do something other than take the square root at this point? Uh, if yes, then you know, explain a little bit in your notes, to yourself in your notes. I think you're trying to do that because you see it in the square root. But we're going to not take the square root. So let's back up to where she was before that. She had 3w squared equals 213. We're saying she should do something other than take the square root. Divide that this by 2. Divide, what about this? We divide this by 2? Well, this was negative and negative to start with, so if I multiply both sides by negative one, then they both become positive. And so uh, that or this, if we started with this, we wouldn't divide by three, divide by negative three, just do it all at once. Or if we got three, divide by three. Uh, so w squared equals 71. I remember that from last class. I feel like we're really smart by the time I get to the third algebra two class. What now? Only thing on this side is something that's squared. That's what means you want to take the square root. You want to get that squared by itself. So W equals what? Plus or minus the square root of 71. Why do we say plus or minus? Because it can be negative or positive. Why can it be negative or positive? Because we're not sure what W is. And so it could be either if this is negative, then make that one a negative. Let's make this one a negative? Yeah. Not quite. If w were negative, we would just be multiplying it by itself. If we multiply a negative by itself, what would we get? A higher number. Positive. A positive number. If we take a positive times a positive, we also get a positive. So to get 71, we just take the square root of 71, and whether it's positive times positive, or negative square root of 71 times negative square root of 71, we still get positive square root of 71. So when you square numbers, they come out positive, um, meaning that we could square a negative number. Um, yes. Seed on your note there. One more. We can see one correct. Dalton. I like what they can name. Dalton solves this quadratic equation correctly. A good job. Dalton first. step, he's gotten x plus 2 squared by itself. Why did you do that? Why did he get that by itself? Why didn't he just maybe from the beginning multiply it all out? All right, x plus 2 times x plus 2, do the distribution. Uh, distribute that 2 after you've done that. Why didn't he do that? Instead. say about that. This is I, I included that question because it often is what people try. Instead of uh, getting the square root by itself, they immediately just multiply those two things together. That turns out to not work out so well. Why is that? You don't get square root from it. What's that? You don't get square root uh, square root number. Number that's squared. A number what do you mean by a number that's squared? Like uh uh, like so, when you do all that and stuff like that, you come out with like a, a weird number, and it don't, and it doesn't, uh, it's not square, and so you don't get a really good answer. Uh, so if you multiply it out, then we wouldn't get it. Are you, so are you talking about this side isn't a square, or this side's not a square number? 
the uh, equal sign. On equal this side, sign. it's not a square number? Yeah, it won't be an equal. It won't be squared. Um, I just remember the and sign was nice when I spell it. It was weird. The answer's right here. Well, when I, yeah, when I did it on my homework, I know yeah. it's wrong, and so I just kind of, because I did the way that you said that. Uh, oh, to multiply it out. Yeah. So you multiplied it out, and it didn't work out. Yeah, because it wasn't squared. It wasn't squared. I'm not just not sure I understand what you mean by that. Remember at the end, and when I got and when I did all the multiplication and yeah. like and stuff like that, it uh, wasn't squared to three, and then so yeah. Multiply it out, which we could we could do that really quick. Uh, we'll get uh, we'll get zero on this side. We'll just approach it like the same as we've been doing. We'll get two times x squared plus four x plus four uh, minus thirteen. Uh, so we get two x squared plus eight x. This will be eight minus thirteen is negative five equals zero. It looks normal, normal enough, like something from 4.4. .4. If you try to factor that, and you do, maybe do like that x thing, like that, that won't work. If you guess and check it, it won't work. It's not factorable. It's not factorable. So in that case, we just wouldn't be able to find an answer. Unless we were really crazy, like linked in with math, and we thought of not just using like factors of five, like one and five, but square root of five. really weird numbers that you just wouldn't think to use. It wouldn't even be solvable if you were to approach it in the old school way. Um, there's another way to say it. It just comes out too weird. You can't yeah. factor it. You yeah. can't solve it. It's impossible to factor and to get solutions that way. Okay. So then leaving it that way, what advantage does that give us at some point in the process? Leave it as a thing that's squared. And what do we get for zero? Okay. You just take the square root of x plus two squared, and that would have x plus two. Yes, I know my questions are kind of. I try not to give away the answer, so they're very they're sometimes hard to answer. So I appreciate you guys taking a crack at them when they sound weird. So yeah, what I'm getting at is if we leave it as a thing squared, then we can take the square root of that thing. Square root of a square thing, you just get the thing just being squared. The square root of x, the square root of x plus two squared is x plus two. Okay. Um, why doesn't it just multiply it out? And so we can use square roots. Also, if you were to multiply it out, it becomes impossible to solve. Using factoring, it's not possible to factor that. Not reasonably possible. So I'm going to say this again. Taking the square root is amazing. We love it. We want to do it. If we could possibly solve every problem this way, it would make all of them possible. If all quadratic equations were written in this way, where we have a quantity squared, it would be perfect. We could solve every one of them because. If we just get this thing by itself, which isn't too difficult, we could just add five to both sides, divide by two, and then take the square root. And even though that square looks really square root looks really gross, it's still usable. It's still a number. It's better than this. We didn't get any answers for this. Here we actually do get answers. Okay. Uh, in the steps circled in purple right there, um, how has Dalton rewritten the fraction? This way. So here we have this fraction here, root 13 over root 2, and here we have root 2, two times root 2 over 2. How did that happen? Kayla? Um, you multiply the, the, the square root of 13 over 2 to the minus square root of 2. Multiply by square root of 2 over square root of 2, right? Ooh, lots of square roots. <laughs> it gets all tied up. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. That's just like the definition of the square root of 2. If you multiply the square root by, the, by itself, then you get that number that is the square root of it. It's the square root of 2, so if you multiply it by itself, you get 2. 
square root of three, or square root of 13 times the square root of two is the square root of 26. Get that involved. Do you remember what that process is called when you multiply this by itself and you get this nice not square root? What did we talk about that? Uh, what did we talk Rationalizing the denominator. What kind of a number is the square root of two? <laughs> Remember we talked about all these different kinds of numbers, whole numbers, integers. What kind of what kind of number is the square root of two? Irrational. Irrational. What kind of number is two? Rational. We rationalize the denominator. We made what was irrational rational. We can always do that by just multiplying the square root of the big wacky thing by the square root of that big wacky. Would you like to know why we do that? Because say we have the square root of three over the square root of two. Now if you wanted the decimal approximation of that, how would you do it? Turns out there used to be a time when there was no calculator. Uh, there also didn't, used to be an internet. Or Google? No, I, yeah. How did people survive? I don't know. We, we nearly didn't. We nearly didn't make it those thousands of years. Um, so before calculators, but after nothing, maybe abacus. So after abacus and before calculator was this thing called a slide rule. You want to see on this crucial has one? Okay, Mr. Hop has one. And then it's so many times the other one. That's a good one. I earned them both. See, they're old. <laughs> uh, so it's a ruler, and it's on something called a logarithmic scale. And I won't even try to tell you what that means. But what it is, is this ruler where the middle piece slides in and out. You line up the little marks. By learning to read this slide rule, you can do some pretty cool calculations. What you cannot do with this is divide by the square root of 2 or some other irrational number. Or at least it's not too easy to do. Okay? So what we do instead is turn this into, by multiplying by the square root of 2 and the square root of 2, we get the square root of 6 over 2. Now taking the square root of 2 and dividing it by 2 is our slide rule. The mathematicians of this era were very influential, and now we always just rationalize the denominator, and that's how we do it. Okay? One of those things is it's, it's a leftover from a bygone era. Yeah. I've seen one of those things before. I just never knew what it was called. A slide rule? Yeah. It was like parents didn't have one. Right. It was a little miniature one. A miniature one? Yeah. That doesn't tell me where you saw it, though. <laughs> <laughs> where did you see it? <laughs> I saw one, but I never, it was never, real small. I didn't, know, I didn't know what it was for. I was like, what the heck is this? Like, it's for art or something like that? Small. Small. I was like, what the heck? I can't get no push. So I was playing around with it and stuff. <laughs> what, uh, okay, so this is a really important section. This is the basis of, uh, of the quadratic formula, which you will derive for me. Okay, not only will you use it, you will derive it. Show me how to make the quadratic formula. If you remember, plus or minus square root of b squared minus 42 over 2a, remember that? No? No? Oh, remember? Oh, well, you're a big oh, cheap. We'll relearn it, and I'll show you how to derive it, but you're going to derive it. And this is the very beginning of the basis of that formula. Okay? Are there any questions? To impart on you the how important it is to inspire you to ask. Oh, your question's out? Yeah.
So what we have here is, uh, first of all, the negative. So y equals, what about when we put a negative in front of there? Down. Y equals down. down. What's that? Down. 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 It goes down. Because it's 1, and 1 squared is 1, but negative that is negative 1. And 2 squared is 4, but you put a negative on it, it's negative 4. 3 squared is 9, but you put a negative on it, it's negative 9. And on it goes. Happens when we put a one fifth in front of that. Not negative one fifth, just one fifth for now. Uh, square a number. And then you take one fifth of that number. So now the output is one fifth of what it used to be. Instead of getting one one, you get one comma one fifth because you multiply one squared by one fifth. So it's one, not one one, but one one fifth. Let's go all the way out to five. On x squared, you go up to 5, what do you get as your output? 1 is your output. I'm talking about right here, y squared, or x squared. Go to 5, what's your output at 5? 25, we'll go 25. Okay, so here, you go out to 5, 5 squared is 25, but then we multiply by 1 fifth. What's 25 times 1 fifth? What? 25 times 1 fifth? So we go to 5 and uh, 5, where x squared would go 525, which would be like way up here. So there's the 1 fifth x squared. Here's x squared. Way up there. <laughs> so how do they compare? Steeper. This one's steeper. This one isn't as steep. Well, it's every bit as tall, though, because I can keep on drawing this, and it's as tall now, right? It's as tall as this is, but as I can way out here, to get as tall as this one. So either one of them is taller than the other one, so they go on forever. They put little arrowheads on them to show that they go on forever, right? They only look taller because I had stopped drawing. So if I keep drawing it, they, they can be at the same height, whatever height you want to be. So here we have those two things put together. This will make it open down. This will make it one fifth as steep. So our vertex will be right at the origin. That doesn't change anything. Put it to zero, you still get out zero. So then we could say go out to five and go down to five. Put a point there, and now we can graph. Symmetry, since it asked. So here there is right there. Axis of symmetry is x equals zero and our vertex is zero comma zero. <coughs> we'll go over ten and seven. Seven graph dot yeah. If we did x squared plus 2, we get all the same outputs as x squared. We would get 4, and we would get 9, and we would get 16, and 25, all those ones. But then when we add 2 to those, we don't get 4, we add 2, we get 6. So we would go to 0, put in 0, get out 0, but add 2, we get 2, you get 0, 2. Right? So how does that, adding that number, affect the graph? This moves it, 
we, we add it after we get the output, right? We go uh, zero, zero, but then we add two to the output, which makes it zero, two. We go one comma one, we add two, we are at one, three. We go to two, two squared is four, but then we add two and we go up to six. Yeah. So we just move everything up to it. increases the output, the vertical, by two. It's just straight through the middle. Moves it up two. Um, this is the one that you were thinking of, Caroline, where when we add three, it moves it which way? Everywhere else it's the same. It goes, if you move over one, you go up one, you go over two, you go up four, you go over three, you go up nine. Okay. If we do both of those things, well, then both of those things happen. It moves to the left three, and it moves up two. But nothing else has changed. It's not upside down, it's not steeper or less steep. Nothing's multiplied by its own two. So it still goes up. So um, you go over here, move over two. It, which you could just guess and check it if you wanted to. You just need to make sure that this term and this term multiply together to make 3x squared, which is use 3x and x. Make sure that this number times this number is negative 12, so maybe plus 1 and minus 12. So we do get the 3x squared that we need, and we do get this number times that number is negative 12. But if we were to multiply these out, we would not trying different numbers here to, uh, to get negative 5. So if you want, you can guess and check. Um, that might not be such a bad idea because you only have um, 3x and x is the only way to factor 3x squared. But maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you just want a reminder of this other way that I taught you. AC mean? Where? Three times two times C. It's what? A times C. A times C. What's A? Three and C is what? Negative twelve. Negative twelve. So we're going to get negative thirty-six when we multiply those together. B is negative five. And now we're looking for two numbers. Those two numbers. What do they do? Thirty-six. Negative thirty-six. And add up to negative five. Okay. So here is what we've done. We found these two numbers. Our whole process was to find those two numbers. They're very specific and very important. Now 
we write this as this negative five x is negative nine x plus four x. If we were to add these together, we would get negative five x. Now it's important that we go through this process and split negative five into exactly the right numbers so that this number will share factors with three and this number will share factors with 12. That's why we created this number here. ourselves about this group. What they share, what do they share? Three. Three? And an X. We undistribute, remember we talked about undistributing or factoring? X minus three. And it's definitely the, the best factoring that we could do, the best undistributing we could do. There's nothing else to undistribute or factor. What do these two have in common? A two, but even more than that, a four. If we do x minus three, four times x is four x, four times negative three is negative 12. This is x, we've undistributed correctly. And now these two, we've made two terms now. Here there were four, now there are two. This one, this one. And each of these has a common factor, a factor of x minus three. So we're gonna undistribute that factor x minus 3 times 3x plus 4. Okay, we could have guessed and checked and, and made that happen. Um, it's up to you if you want to spend your time that way or if you want to use this. This applies to every, every factoring process. Was that in the end? We're not quite done because this is solid. Always done Okay, what do we do next? After we factored it. Uh, if we distribute it, we're just gonna wanna do this. Is that what? Is that x minus three to the zero and three x plus four to the zero? Right. Why can we do that? these two numbers together, this one, this one, and we got zero. The only way for that to happen is for one of those things to be multiplied by to be zero. So both zero and solve for x. So x is three, x is negative four thirds. Subtract four, divide by three, and that's it. Again, your other option for factoring is to do the guessing and checking, knowing that the two x terms, these two x terms have to multiply to three x squared, and these two constants have to multiply to negative 12. And then when we do distribute it all out, we have to get negative 5x. Okay. What was the next one, 10? that in, we can distribute the two first, we can do the two decimals together first, we can actually do two times this thing first. It's up to us, what do we want to do first? Multiply the binomials together, binomial, binomial, multiply in the middle first. Two times, we got x squared minus three x plus four x minus 12. Two x squared plus two x minus twenty-four plus three. If you don't remember how to multiply this together, just remember that it's distribution. So we're distributing this back. So everything in here has to be distributed there. We're going to distribute the x all the way through. And we've run out of things 
to distribute it to? Now we distribute the negative 3 to there and to there. Now we've got everything we can distribute it to. Or you can do it in any order you want, just as long as everything is paired up with everything else. And when everything gets paired together, multiply it. That's all that matters. Right? Any other questions? what I'm about to say doesn't apply to this problem, but you should always check. Every time you're going to factor a polynomial, check and see, do all of these have something in common that we can undistribute, that we can factor out? Uh, almost. This has a 4. This has a 4. This one doesn't, though. So, And, and there's not any factor that they all share. So we're not going to factor them all out. We always want to check and see. It'll make our lives easier if there, if there happens to be something we can factor out. In this case, there's not. So we just start right into that AC method. AC. guys, what do they have in common? Two and four. And three. They have a two and an x. Two x minus seven. What do these two have in common? X. No, this one doesn't have an x. So one. You can call it one. It's kind of silly to write one times thirteen, but it does help us kind of see what the next step is going to look like. Again, these two terms, this term, this big guy right here, and this one right here, both have a factor of 2x minus 7. We undistribute the 2x minus 7, just like we undistributed this 2x in, uh, in that example. And then we would be left with 2x plus 1. If you distribute the 2x minus 7 to 2x, you'd have 2x times 2x minus 7. If you distribute the 2x minus 7 to negative 1, uh, not negative 1, 2x minus 7 to 1, you get 1 times Always guess and check. You can do try and split up 4x squared and negative 7 until it just all works out. Number one. Graphing these is all about finding some points, and you don't really just want to plug in numbers. Like we, we would like to find some specific points to tell us for sure. Like the shape of the graph uh, should be like this. It should be this deep. It should be located in this place. And rather than just randomly taking stabs in the dark, we uh, we use some of the information we derived or been given to find specific points. Points like the x-intercept and the vertex. Um, we find the axis of symmetry, where that is. So here we have this uh, equation. It's in standard form. It's not a vertex form. It's not an intercept form. It's in standard form. How do we handle an uh, equation in standard form? Yeah. You would use the equation that's proportional to the other two. Okay. Well, that must be a specific x, right? There's lots of x values. Actually, any x value can go into this function. So what, what's special about this x value? What? The squared? Well, this x value is an x value on the graph somewhere. Right? What's special about, say that x value came out to be this. What's special about that x value? It's the vertex. Right, it's on the vertex, right? The vertex is at that x value. Which means we're also going to have to find a y value, because that's 
all points have an x and a y. So first, let's find the dx value. So negative b over 2a, that comes out to be negative 1. So the vertex is at negative 1, comma, something. How do we find that y value? Anytime you want to find a y value, look at this. You just plug in some x value. Plug in negative 1, we get negative 1 squared is 1, 2 times 1 is 3, minus 6. So 3 minus 6 is negative 3, plus 4 is a 1. Negative 1 comma 1, that's our vertex. Right through the vertex is the axis of symmetry. That's great, we have lots of information, but we don't have quite enough to draw a parabola. What else do we need? Five to zero. Okay. Let me ask you this though. Here's the vertex. Do you know which way it's going to open based on its equation? Mm -hmm. Which way is it going to open? Uh, up. It's going to open up. So is it going to have any zeros? Mm -hmm. if, it, if it has zeros, that means that the graph will cross the x-axis, right? So find the zeros means make y equal to zero, factor it, and solve it, right? But if we look at the graph, we know it's going to open up. So y is never going to be equal to zero by a lot here. Y will never be equal to zero. Y at the least will be one, and then we'll just go up from there. All the y values are bigger than one. So that is an idea that, that we could try. Just to save you a little bit of time showing it, it's not going to have any zeros. If you try to do that, it's just you, you wouldn't be able to factor. Intercept, how do we find the y intercept? Um. <laughs> y intercept is the point on the y axis? Plus B. This doesn't have anything to do with our x plus b. Not a thing, okay? <laughs> Incidentally, it will happen in this one, but that's pretty coincidental. If we made this anything other than plus four, it would be true. But this doesn't tell us that. It doesn't tell us how far up and how far over to go. Uh, we could kind of do that uh, if it was a vertex. The y-intercept is along the y-axis. All points on the y-axis have an x of what? What x value does a point on the y-axis have? Zero. zero. So the x value will be zero. So if we plug zero in for x, it turns out to be a pretty easy thing to do. Plug in zero, all the stuff is four. Standard form, just find that vertex. Just find some other points. We could have plugged in zero, we could have plugged in one or two, negative two, negative three, whatever we want to plug in, we can plug in and find a y value. You could plug in bunches of x values and find y values and plot all those points and just hope for the best. But by finding the vertex, we know exactly where the center of the parabola is, and so we know that it should come down to there and go back up. And we can just find a couple. this yeah. if it's in standard form. Standard form is ax squared plus bx plus b. Okay. 
this is five and zeros, it just means that y is zero. And the zeros would be the values of x that you caused that to happen. So it's just solving this equation. We solve x squared minus 11 x is 10 equals zero. So that would be solved this So you're just doing normal, everyday factoring. Yeah. Okay, so we factor, and when we factor, when we factor, we find that we get what now? We get x minus 2 and x minus 1. And x minus 1. And we talked about this earlier, we put them equal to 0, because something has to be equal to 0, which means one of them has to be 0. Factors. This is, this is a multiple choice. You could just multiply all the multiple choices together and see which one comes out the way that it's supposed to. Um, or you could just do some factoring. Okay, what well, multiplies the negative 40 and adds to 3? method again. 10 times negative 20 is negative 200. B is negative 17. What multiplies to negative 200 it adds to negative 17. I think it was 25? No. 25 at 8? minus 25x plus 8x minus 20. Put these together, what do they have in common?
same thing for negative 5, 5 is the exponent of negative 5. Do you know? Do you know that the intercept form is just the intercept form? Yeah. Is that on here? The intercept form is just, they, they give it to you in factored form, it's factored out, okay? Oh. And the reason why that's simple is, um, I don't know if it's in factored form. That's a mixture. Like, number nine. Let me give you this. called intercept form because we're finding the x-intercepts. We can find the x-intercepts whenever y is 0. y is 0 all along the x-axis. So if we let y be 0, we set this equal to 0. Well, we're multiplying a bunch of stuff together. This times this times this equals 0. Well, then one of those things has to be 0 that we're multiplying by. So either this is 0, which is ridiculous. That can't be 0. Or this is 0, which means x is 5. Or this is zero, and in this case, uh, x minus five is equal to zero. It's the same thing. So our two x-intercepts are both at five. Well, that means that the parabola only touches it in one place, which means that this point must be the what? The vertex. So there's our axis of symmetry, and uh, maybe we go to uh, four. We plug in four for x see what we get out for y. Uh, 4 minus 5 is negative 1. We get negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. Times negative 3 is negative 3. So 4 comma negative 3. I just showed like a group test where you like put a problem up there and we discuss as a class how to look at the answers. And then we all get it. different from the other classes, but it's process should not look like, I know that there's this test with this quiz coming up, let me cram for it, and then do however I do it. No. They give you a quiz, uh, and they give you the, the opportunity to retake it. You should do that every single day. And if you guys take all the time to, to ask all these questions, um, that's because you weren't staying uh, you know, right up to
a situation where your grade was impacted and you had, nothing, you had no way to, to fix that? 